Um, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Sophie Watson. I'm one of the directors of CREST. Um, I'd like to welcome you tonight to our public lecture. It's lovely to see such a full hall. It's very rather marvelous profit room, so I think this is the fitting, fitting room for the tour we have tonight. Um, what will happen, of course, will be known to you all. Um, he is currently the principal of Hartford College in Oxford and also chair of the Big Innovation Centre. He was previously chief executive of the Work Foundation from 2000 to 2008 and also editor in chief of the Observer. Um, since the 90s, he's been a very renowned figure on the centre left as an advocate of stakeholder capitalism and the European model. First, when he was the economic editor of The Guardian, and then in a very important book, I think, um, The Stadium Inn, which was uh, reflected the mood of the, the new Labour uh, government, which came in in 1997. So he's, um, since that time, written numerous articles which have provoked us to think in all sorts of different ways, and he's always provocative and, and fascinating, I'm sure he will be tonight, and um, also has written uh, a book. Uh, subsequent to that, which was uh, the world where in which looked at the differences between the US and the European uh, bloc in terms of social and cultural differences, which is a very helpful way of thinking about where we sat at, as we came somewhere between. Anyway, um, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Will, who's going to talk tonight on the history of Joe, extinguish the left, and create a first order crisis in capitalism. Welcome to you, Will. <laughs> Lloyd Bank, after it emerged, they had to 
pronounced as murder of a tree and um, well, de facto bust. That's one part of the landscape. Then, you, then for 50 years, the run to that, there'd be this huge investment in, in uh, property, construction, financial services, you know, uh, manual services, uh, okay, export oriented service industries, you know, honest to God manufacturing had been completely neglected. And during the massive distorted economy, Banks that were passing, overhang of debt, and you had this happening not just in Britain, but actually in Europe and North America. And the idea that um, you could, that as the private sector tried to lower its debt and build up its savings, that uh, you could simultaneously ask the public sector to, to do the same thing, and that there would be the biggest investment boom and biggest export boom. Since 1945, was risible nonsense. Bank of England, the Treasury, the Office of Budget Responsibility, uh, many um, economists and many of our companies bought into the notion that actually, like Lazarus, you know, this economy would get off its knees and you know, do the business. Uh, <clears throat> four years on, and GDP is still 4% below the peak it was in 2008. Four years later, by 1933, output had recovered the levels it was in 1929. We won't get back, uh, and it's not even certain we will get back, but as man said, we won't get back to 2008 levels of output to 2014, six years. You have to go back um, to the 1870s and 1880s for a recession that long and that <coughs> deep. And actually, with that squeeze on people's living standards. And you know, in Manchester, of course, we're reminded I mean, that was the birth of the Crofton movement. That was the birth of the Labour movement. You know, that's when uh, you know, working class people started talking about socialism. You know, some years later, it's the rag and trousers of the philanthropist. Though, though we are living through today the conditions that incubated that response in the 1870s and 1880s. Of course, we do it without an empire. Um, there's no imperial preference to help us go out of this problem in, 19, uh, in, in 2012. We do it with um, our industrial reserves having plummeted. Oh, what a shame it was that we didn't um, build a sovereign wealth fund like the Norwegians um, without our revenues, which was actually what Tony Benn tried to do in the 1970s. Uh, we, there's not going to be a credit boom um, that pulled us out of recession from the early 80s until 2008. Again, it can't happen. You know, this time around, you know, some really tough questions have to be asked uh, of um, our economy and our business class and our financial class about how this country is going to make its living in the world. The response can't be to socialise the means of production. And I, I, we kind of know from the 20th century that that leads to less than perfect uh, results, to say it kindly. Which is why, since I wrote the stable in, um, in the mid 1990s, and I called it Stable in Capitalism, and the publisher's blur, saying it was the second best selling book in the 20th century. And not that it mattered very much, was Nobody had really notice of it um, uh, in office. But it was trying to say what I'm trying to tell you tonight that actually uh, the foundations of our capitalism in this country are rotten. And uh, we need to put new institutional structure uh, to reconfigure them. And actually, interestingly, I think there are lots of interesting schools in your wind uh, that suggest that uh, not just. Um, um, Failing public intellectuals might look up and think this. But actually, um, um, the people in the, in the business and financial community are going to talk in these terms. Um, Anthony Jenkins, um, the Englishman who took over as chief executive of the Barclays Bank last week, in his um, middle press release that accompanied his appointment, uh, interesting appointment, and what was not an American investment banker that was chosen by Barclays, but was a huge finance man that Barclays bought over. Um, but it was, a, it was an Englishman from the commercial who said, this is banking now, and he said, my job, the chief executive of this bank, is to rebuild um, trust, to 
to serve our customers, our shareholders, our employees, and our stakeholders in the short and the long term. And the immediate blow, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the cost of capital uh, that actually Barclays had to meet as a hurdle rate for its projects at Bob Diamond said, from 13 to 15% to 11%. Uh, and then we were, and Mr. Jenkins uh, is a new kind of businessman in our banking community. I don't have much time, and I'm sure none of you have, for the murder of the clan, but I thought, um, the element of it being self serving, but I thought the remarks by Elizabeth Murdoch uh, giving the change in a tired lecture at the Royal Moon Society uh, just 10 days ago were fascinating. Her brother James, um, who now familiar to us all, and uh, that in the Montaga election 2009, so um, echoing the uh, ideas that Shell the value maximization is the only point of the quoted company, that profit was the sole purpose of this corporation, News International, and that was the best guarantor for <coughs> independence, which was also the best guarantor of, uh, of news that was not interfered with. And his sister, three years later, and in the wake of the hacking crisis and all else, um, told her audience that actually um, profit, uh, unattached to a sense of, to a clear, clear business purpose with a moral center, that profit without that that had led a news corporation into the problems that it got into. It was the only thing that news corp executives had was to second guess what we were murdered for. And many of the problems uh, fell out from the financialization of uh, this company uh, progressively over the um, last 20 years. And the dropping of any attempt, any of the profit maximizing media company, I thought interesting, to say the least, uh, in two unexpected parts of the forest, uh, it was like a taller language of responsible stakeholder good capitalism, um, and challenging um, the kind of received wisdom of the last um, um, 20 years. And when Michael Fallow uh, appointed a uh, business minister in the reshuffle, uh, says that he's now going to be the voice of business in the department of business against the alleged anti-business, uh, secular business, and uh, his cable. I wonder which part of this community who Mr. Bauer thinks he's going to speak. He will not speak um, for either as Mr. Murdoch or Alfred Jenkins. Um, I could run off a dozen other um, CEOs in traditional companies who would not want the simple notion that all business wants is less red tape, less deregulate, less uh, regulation, and crash program and deficit reduction is the, is the alleged business agenda is not what they think at all. So the mood of the, the, the mood of the business and financial community is changing as it must before the um, magnitude of the, of, the, of the problems that um, we confront. And before I just show you a few um, uh, a few ideas about the scale of the crisis and argue what I think a good capitalism looks like and uh, then try to ask the question, is it feasible? Uh, let's make another point, which I think um, uh, um, I'm sure a lot of people are going to these numbers, but uh, I found that uh, they really took me aback. Overlaid all that I described, and there's another phenomenon. Financialization of our corporate sector, uh, which has meant that the ownership of our great companies is extraordinarily transactional. Uh, the average length of time the share is held is now seven months compared with seven years in 2010, um, has led to the stock market no longer being a vehicle for the raising of capital. Instead, the stock market has become the vehicle um, for which one company takes over another in a doom and dying <coughs> and Darwinian struggle in which the autonomy of a company um, is phenomenally insecure. Um, you, and two things have happened. There were 2,000 quit companies in Britain in 2000. 
in 2012, it's just 1,100. 900 companies have actually left the stock market in just over a decade, <coughs> and gone private, been taken over by foreign companies, or taken from private equity. And those that remain have built up an extraordinary um, cash uh, hoard, which they do not spend on investment or innovation, but they spend on buying their own shares back for, uh, to protect themselves and to guarantee their independence in this extraordinary kind of financialized stock market that has emerged. Yeah. And so not only is there a crisis of finance, not only is there a crisis of debt legacy, not only is there a crisis of misallocation of resource, not only is there a crisis of production, uh, there's also a crisis of ownership. I call this a crisis of capitalism. And uh, I'm perfectly at home talking about this with any of the great I think of the last 150 years, except there's almost none left. Uh, at this moment, uh, you know, everyone's hoping um, to get back to business as usual, but actually, uh, a 10 billion pound loan guarantee program for the housing market, 40 billion pounds of loan guarantees to support. Companies want to take infrastructure spending and eliminating red tape. I mean, this red tape, you know, as if, as, as you know, when I, when I describe what's going to do, who but Nigel Farage and Michael Fallon could think that 900 companies in the stock market are going to do red tape? I mean, the big, big things are afoot in our country, and not just afoot in our country, afoot across the West. And actually, to describe them, as a product of uh, red tape, <clears throat> is I think to plan, is such a trivialization of, uh, of, of where we are. It's, it's um, mind boggling. And of course, um, it betokens something else. Um, it betokens the death of conservatism. Uh, I make a bold prediction out of the public election last year, but I think George Osborne um, is the last purely conservative chancellor we're going to see holding on to a generation. The mistakes he's made are of such um, kind of seriousness. Um, the spontaneous booming uh, by 80,000 people at uh, the Paralympics over this group. What the bar of public opinion think of him? The Cameron is wedded to him because the credibility of the Kurdish government is uh, organized around this uh, very strange. And it's obvious that the coalition government can't survive the 2015, and it's obvious that they won't be re-elected. Um, the last time I saw a politician boom on that scale was um, in Paris, when Gordon Brown boom in 2007, uh, World Cup by Robert O'Connor. <laughs> um, and I knew that was perfect for Gordon. Um, <laughs> oh, I um, so, look, I, I'm, there's, I've already used about 20 minutes. I've got about 20 minutes left. Um, so I'll, I'll, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a kind of um, a really, really fast um, uh, tour of um, why there was a crisis, why um, I think bad capitalism was the cause of that crisis. I met, if I can, I'll, I'll say a few words about the, uh, the innovation possibilities. I'm going to try and I will spend a little time discussing good capitalism and then we'll jump through a whole bunch of slides and then ask the question, can we build such a thing in Britain and what would it take to do it? And so you're, you're, what you're going to watch is, you know, you, you may be tantalized, maybe want to spend time on these things, but I there's just not the time. If there's in the Q&A session, you can come back to it. So I'm not going to discuss that. This is a book where I will start. Um, bank assets as a proportion of Britain's GDP have rose to five times. If you look at that, can you see that at the back? Can you see? I mean, you can see broadly from the uh, kind of last decades of the 19th century up to 1970, uh, and commercial credit control, that bank assets in Britain were about half our GDP and bank loans. Uh, then you can see they doubled. Uh, then you can see they doubled again after Big Bang. 
Uh, and um, one, one of the points I'd like to whether whether there's two or three principles which kind of underpin uh, my notion uh, of free capitalism. Uh, one is is that um, uh, risk no individual bank or capitalist firm any more than an individual member of the British public can manage the amount of risk that's out there themselves. You have to have risk distribution systems in your capitalism if you're going to get um, entrepreneurial activity, uh, risks taken that actually lead to the economic and social good of innovation happening and productivity generating investment taking place. Um, the, that can be um, the whole theory of the behind a portfolio of uh, loans or investments to uh, mitigate and spread your risk. It's also, of course, the ultimate kind of risk sharer in a capitalist society is the state. And no serious uh, technological or innovative leap has been made uh, you know, since the Middle Ages without one in one way or another, a public agency acting as a backstop to uh, share the risk. Not one company in the FTSE 100, not one company in the Fortune 500 uh, has managed to build their franchise without it being co-created in some way with a public agency. That's the first point about a good capitalism, and understanding that and not believing Tish adoptions, like <coughs> entrepreneurs taking swipe up their risks and the state and its are a burden upon wealth generation. The truth is the exact opposite. Uh, second, that's the first thing about a, uh, a, um, uh, a, a good capitalism. Um, the second point about good capitalism, because of the, uh, the uncertainty that's involved, um, the second thing about good capitalism is the notion of stewardship. <coughs> that actually uh, you have to be able to uh, take a view over time of uh, how you, um, of the um, custodianship of the assets in which you're building. Um, um, companies uh, are not actually playthings and we bought and sold like casino chips and uh, living, breathing social organisations. Uh, and lastly, a good capitalism is featured by a profound sense of fairness, a degree of about proportionality um, between contri the contribution you make uh, and, the, uh, and, the, uh, and the revenue or the income you receive. Um, those three principles were trashed uh, in this period. Banks thought they could manage risk without a state or without regulation, but they um, they thought that they, uh, that they had no sense of um, uh, stewardship and they had massive disproportionality in the rewards and profits they made. This was done without a capital underpinning it, track, 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 so the 2000 the whole edifice couldn't be more risky. Um, but uh, this is the, how the assets and liabilities were spread. Um, only 5% of the enormous amount of that of those uh, back loan went to British companies. Only 1% of those assets, we now know, went to innovative companies and sectors. After most bubbles, even the tulip mania or the railway bubble, you're left with something to show that the bubble tulips or railways. <laughs> <laughs> We've left with close to nothing. Um, the return on equity boomed, as it would do, as less and less capital, <coughs> more and more revenue, more and more profit, and of course, salaries shot up, just as they shot up to a peak in 1930 when the same thing happened, they fell away again, and they shot up in uh, 2008. And one thing I can guarantee you folks is that um, when I show you this number two in 20 years' time, I'm on a Zimmer frame, it will be down here. Um, because there will be exactly the same way there was a societal response to the excess of the 20s, there was a societal response to the excess in the 2000s. Clear. All it could take place, actually. Um, this is the consequence. Um, the recession that is um, still, you know, four years long, and not even to get back up to that part of the graph. Um, 
Of course, another aspect of this, which uh, uh, you, you won't find, and this, for some of you, um, this will actually convince some of you that I am, um, have lost my senses. Um, but all this took place with Britain having a floating exchange rate. Now, uh, if you're on the left, you're in massively in favor of floating exchange rate because it gives you autonomy over economic, over economic policy, straight from fiscal policy, much of fiscal policy. <coughs> you don't have to get all out of this dreadful Europeans. Uh, fixed peg exchange rate for the euro, or the part of the fixed exchange rate system. If you're on the right, um, the floating exchange rate system is believed positive of the wonderfulness of the free market. The consequence of the floating exchange rate and the period of Brit British banks' assets went up to five times the fee was the sucking in of enormous amounts of capital from abroad to finance that credit growth. Many of you who bought your houses and flats in this period, those of you who were part of it, for money that came from abroad, that drove up the exchange rate well above its long run equilibrium rate, which led to a calamitous fall away in our trade deficit. Um, we, uh, uh, um, uh, this is the most unfashionable view. Probably uh, maybe about 10 people in the hall would agree with me. Um, but of course, if Britain had joined the Euro in 1999, um, this would not have happened. Our manufacturing sector would now be 15 to 16 percent of the GDP and not 12 percent of the GDP, and our trade deficit would not be so big. Um, and people like me who argued that the only way to join Europe is if um, the kinds of reforms that are now being considered, like the European Central Bank, letting to tie Eurozone and Venezuela as a resort, that had to be the kind of Europe we had to join. The whole story of the last 10 years might have been very different and actually contemporary Europe, but that's a lost battle. But um, anyway, I've now confirmed your view that I've uh, lost it, but I'll move on quickly. Um, this is just to show you that um, this is not a domestic crisis, but an international one. Um, yes, Britain has most bank assets. This is kind of a net amount of actually to capture the uh, interbank lending. But you know, the Dutch, the Swiss, the Swedish, the Danes, the Irish, the Spanish, the French, even those virtuous Germans have got very, very high levels of, uh, of, of, uh, of debt. Um, I, uh, I just want to pause now. Um, you know, why did that take place? And I think you know, we, were, we were told a story, and uh, we were told a story, uh, we were told a story um, since the, uh, I guess the late 70s, we gathered pace throughout the Thatcher years, um, that actually uh, wealth generation was. Uh, only done by an un unabated private sector. Um, profit motive uh, was a uh, driver. There, there was no role um, for co creation with uh, the public sphere. Um, the regulation, the taxation, the burdens. And you know, essentially, the story that actually any attempt to uh, uh, build organized labor into the capitalist story was uh, a little market inflexibility. You know. and, uh, I think that um, uh, uh, the capacity uh, of the banks in particular to sell the idea to regulators and publics that actually what the, the progressive fall away in regulation that took place between the mid 80s and late um, 2000s uh, was A, good, B, intellectually justified. I mean, it was a huge intellectual mistake. Uh, and it was a misconception about how you do capitalism. <clears throat> and here's uh, how I think one should conceive of how one does capitalism. I think there is, I think that one can make judgments and um, for a start about entrepreneurship. Um, I do, I, um, I will tick a box with James Dyson there. Um, I'm, I'm much less happy um, but now so is the Barclays Bank board with Bob Diamond. Um, you know, a, a capitalism that can justify itself has to have a production orientation. And of course that's what exists in uh, Germany and exists in Sweden and to a lesser extent uh, exists in uh, Japan and parts of Asia. You know, we've actually, I mean Manchester was a tribute to reductive entrepreneurship. And for 30 years we've said you don't worry about it. Um, financial services, tax avoidance, 
um, you have an art of daily approach to capitalism, it's perfectly okay, wrong. Um, a capitalism that I think uh, uh, is a good capitalism um, has to privilege the insertion over the incumbent. <laughs> and you can be certain that I mean, one of the reasons why I was so anti, and a number of other words were everyone else now, was so anti News International taking over B Sky B was actually, I mean, that would mean that I mean, half of UK TV revenues would be held by one company. And I knew a number of companies in the States and in Europe who wouldn't enter the UK TV market because it was all wrapped up by Mr. Murdoch. So you know, Jeremy Hunt and others, with a, a gog to admire Mr. Murdoch's achievement, were actually a champion, champion bad capitalism. They were making it impossible for insurgents to go into the UK TV market. You know, I've mentioned the fact that um, our shares are held only seven months on average, but not seven years. You know, uh, ownership has to be, you have to have committed ownership, and I think also you have to have patriotic ownership. I've been increasingly concerned um, watching you know, the success of Britain in the Olympics. You know, it was a wonderful patriot, it was a, a kind of an open, kind of generous patriotism, I thought. But of course, you know, what lay behind it was um, commitment, public purpose, and doing it for Britain. Actually, too few people um, in the British business and financial class have any serious loyalty to our country. And there's a, it's a co collaborative. You really can't do innovation, investment, driving companies forward you know, without um, uh, you know, being able to integrate um, all the actors in the act of production in a collaborative fashion. Uh, and I think you just run, I, think, I, I don't want to go through this too in a labour way, uh, but um, high trust workplaces, proportionally rewarded managers, uh, transparency, uh, understanding the interdependence of the public and the private. Um, anyone who understands good capitalism would never allow the words, um, we're going to um, get red tape off businesses' shoulders or we're going to um, let the wealth generators free, we're going to dead hand off the state off their back. Actually, you need a smart state and you need smart regulation um, to drive your capitalism forward. Um, smart regulation would have avoided the, uh, the financial crisis. Um, smart regulation is the reason why the German car industry, uh, as a green, uh, as a committed green industry, is so far ahead of the rest of the European countries. Um, uh, your, politi your political process must be uh, uh, <coughs> open. You can't permit capture by producer groups um, of what's taking place. And above all, I think that the underpinning of this is um, a passionate commitment to fairness. Fairness is not a pie and motherhood. Fairness is about proportionality. It's about recognition that there's a proportional relationship between the effort and the reward. It's recognizing that um, um, uh, <coughs> you should compensate for bad luck and that you've done nothing to deserve. Good luck and that you've done nothing to deserve should not be reason why you get a bonus. Um, and, uh, and there should be a, 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 a process to, to adjudicate those values. That is you know, what I'm trying to say in the state we're in. And that's what I'm trying to um, kind of recap. Um, in Belarus, um, and um, a number of an Indian socialists said to me, "Well, your good capitalism well, was astonished me by my good socialism." <laughs> um, I'm happy for that to be the case. Uh, in British context, I'm kind of making the case for good capitalism for the time being. Um, um, I'll come back to this in the Q&A session if, it, if, if we get there. I, I wanted to tell you a little bit about <coughs> what I consider the way out of this. I'm a massive um, enthusiast um, and believer in the role of general purpose technologies as driver of wealth. Um, when you know, you know, Mitt Romney um, says it was the free market, it was the market of wealth generation. I mean, uh, <laughs> General purpose technologies have been, have been, the, have been the transformational force um, in the West. Um, and each one of these, if I talk you through it, you can see my point about co-production 
uh, and the interdependence of public and private, uh, and the interrelationship between this wider social um, forces, and uh, the, the computer, the internet, the story is impossible uh, without the role of public agencies, and the free market sailing ship, uh, which is an amazing technology in the late uh, 15th century, um, was of course a superb tribute to young Bernardism, uh, Spanish and Portuguese shipwrights that could build a hull strong enough uh, to carry the three miles to permit a sailing ship to serve close to the wind, opening up the navigation of the ocean because it was been closed. Um, it was impossible without um, treasure from the Spanish and Portuguese governments who pumped up. Um, and you find each of these, each of these stories, uh, you'll find a, a, a story of um, but the first technology is a technology with, uh, which has the capacity to change itself and has wide multiple applications. Um, and there will be 20 of them in the 21st century. And the societies that will build them and exploit them will be societies that, in my view, develop a good capitalism. Um, <coughs> some, of the, um, some of the technologies to come, um, I don't want to talk about the process, um, don't want to talk about that. I will spend um, five minutes talking about um, three big things I think we need to do, and then I want to um, answer the question that I was set and why some of you may come to that. Is any of this possible? If we're going to get out of the, of the, of the state we're in, um, there are three big thrusts that have to take place. We have to completely reconceive how we do macroeconomic policy. Um, and here are, I think, some of the technical things that need to take place. Um, I think one of the, one of the obvious things um, is that we need some inflation, uh, because we have to uh, deflate, inflate away the real value of the debt. We need five years of five to six percent inflation, so I think we should adopt the money GDP targets of six percent, um, back to the inflation <coughs> target. Um, I think that, um, interestingly, um, Britain's public debt is at the moment 70% of GDP. Um, it's